you've probably heard people say that all amplifiers sound the same, or at least that all amplifiers that measure well sound the same, or if they measure the same, they sound the same. The problem here is that so many people are stuck in the mire of evaluating the measurement or simply going off of their ears alone that these two arguments clash for no reason at all. The truth of the matter is that amplifiers can and do sound different. About a month and a half ago, I borrowed a Prima Luna Evo 400 tube amplifier from my local dealer, and I also used my Macintosh MC275 Mark VI to do some blind ABX testing. Initially, I set voltage to be the same at one kilohertz. I sat down and there was a huge difference right away. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to do some level matching based on SPL in the listening position. I tried to do that, but that was tough. Then I did an actual electrical frequency response coming out of the amplifier with the speakers attached, and I was shocked, shocked really, at how big a difference the signal was between the two amplifiers. Now, this is what I got. The blue line represents the difference in amplitude over frequency of the Prima Luna Evo 400 compared to the Macintosh MC275. Now, you can see there is much less mid-range warmth in the lower mid-range area, and the high frequency rolls off significantly. In some points, we're talking two to two and a half decibels. That's not chunk change, and you would definitely notice that. I even took the time to perform this testing with myself being recorded, and I have shared that on my Patreon group. If you're interested in watching my full test, it's about a 10-minute video, where I sit there and I blind listen and I flip through them and I holler out, this one's different, this one's different, and I nail that test. Please go to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash and I'll have a link down below if you want to see the full video. Now, the first question is, how the F do you level match that? How? The best thing I could come up with is to try to level match the upper mid range between about two to 4K where our ears are most sensitive. Once I did that, I could still hear a huge difference. The Macintosh sounded more full. It sounded more detailed and the soundstage actually sounded larger. When I was able to apply some EQ to that Macintosh to emulate what the Prima Luna was doing to the speakers, that changed things. Now they were on an even keel. I didn't notice the drastic differences anymore. But the other factor here is if I had level matched these the other way around, so let's say I level matched these to where the mid range, the lower mid range was in line, where that two and a half decibel dip was, then what definitely would have happened is that the Prima Luna would have sounded brighter. Some people may have called that more detailed, more attack, more dynamicism, more clarity in dialogue. And they might have chosen the Prima Luna based on that. So that got me thinking, what's causing this? Output impedance. The best way I can describe output impedance is to think of it like taking a resistor and applying it between the amp and your speaker. For most solid state amps, this value is extremely low. It's close to zero ohms. But for tube amps, or even some modern amps with certain designs, such as maybe a Class D amplifier without a feedback loop, that output impedance can be much higher half an ohm, one ohm, or even more. And that little bit of a resistor, that one or two ohm resistor, it's not trivial. That forms a voltage divider with your speaker's impedance, and that alone can change the response of the output a lot. If your speaker's impedance was flat, like straight four ohm or eight ohm, that'd be one thing. But speaker impedance varies in magnitude and in phase, and this complex impedance in partnership with the output impedance of the amplifier itself creates a lot of variation in the frequency response if you have a high output impedance amplifier. And if you're wondering, the relationship between high output impedance from an amplifier is the opposite for the damping factor. So if you have high output impedance, you're going to have low damping factor. But one unfortunate thing is that output impedance and damping factor both are rarely given per frequency. Most of the time you're gonna see just a single value. Website may say damping factor of 40 at eight ohm or something like that, but it's not gonna tell you much more than that. I did some digging around after my listening test and I found that the Prima Luna actually has an output impedance of about 2.3 ohms. That's really high. A good amplifier should have an output impedance 
let's say below 0.1 ohm, okay? The higher you go, the more variation you're gonna get from that amplifier into your speaker. The output impedance varies with frequency, so that single value doesn't help. You may very well have an amplifier that has low output impedance in a lower frequency, but high output impedance at a higher frequency. Let's take, for example, the WIM amplifier. Now this is a few designs back, so things have changed now and it's gotten better. But as you can see here, you have very low output impedance around 0.1 in the lower frequencies up to about 2K where it starts to increase and it increases pretty rapidly almost to about two ohm at 20 kilohertz. Now this difference alone can cause you to have variations in frequency response. And that's what I'm showing you here. Now these lines each represent a resistor of some sort. The blue line is 4 ohm, the red line is 8 ohm. These are both static loads. The green line and the orange line are both reactive loads that simulate a real speaker, full of crossover components that I had built to spec, and they are built specifically to allow me to test variation in frequency response due to different amplifiers output impedance. So if we take these different loads, the two static loads, four and eight ohm, and the two reactive loads, complex and simple, and apply those to the whim, we can see that there's not a lot of change in the lower frequency. Well, that makes sense because the output impedance is low in those frequencies. But then as we go above about 1K and get into 2K, we start to see variations here. Now, this is two things. Number one, the output impedance of the amplifier is ramping up, as you just saw. And number two, the actual impedance and the phase of the speaker itself or the speaker loads are changing as well for these reactive loads. Let me give you an example of a good case. This is a NAD C3050. The output impedance is measured at about 0.1 ohm low. You shouldn't have any variation of frequency response. And that's what we see here. When I apply my four different loads to this amplifier and sweep the response, there is practically no change. Now, luckily, this issue of output impedance isn't a huge problem for most amplifiers. But as I spoke about earlier, when you go from solid state amplifiers to hybrid amplifiers or class D amplifiers without a feedback loop or really crazy tube amplifier designs, you start ramping up that output impedance. And that output impedance can vary the overall frequency response and change drastically what you hear. And that, that bringing all back together is exactly why people will say, this amp sounds good with this speaker. Now, the problem is that you can't really do that kind of testing, this whole talk of synergy. How in the world are you going to go get all these amplifiers for this one speaker that you have? or take this 15 different speakers and try to pick the best amplifier. You just can't do it. And there's no way for me to provide you with real actual data on these things because I don't have access to all these amplifiers and I don't have access to all of these speakers. However, what I can do is I can simulate a output impedance and apply it to measured impedance of different speakers. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So we're gonna start off with something that has very low output impedance. 0.01 output impedance using this output impedance and 179 real impedance measurements from real speakers. I have simulated the frequency response variation that you could get from a low output impedance amplifier. And that's what we see here. All of these lines, there's 179 of them. They're all pretty much sitting dead at zero. No problem. So what happens if I ramp the output impedance up to something that's like medium, a 0.5 ohm? This is what we get. Now we see there's variation by about as much as one and a half decibels. So then what if I go up to one ohm? That's, that's considered high output impedance. Well, here you go. Two and a half decibel swings. That's a lot. And that is exactly where this term synergy comes into play. It's not necessarily audio mysticism. It can be boiled down to actual physics and electronics engineering. And that can easily explain why you can hear differences. If you're paying attention, the one issue with my model is that I am assuming a constant output impedance. As we saw earlier with that whim, it doesn't have a constant output impedance. But my hope is that these tests alone will give you some idea of the variation here. Now with this knowledge in hand, I compared three different speakers onto different output impedance metrics. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So we've got the Focal Evo X number two, the MoFi Source Point 10 Master Edition. This graphic is going to give you an idea of how much the output impedance is going to shift the frequency response of these given speakers. 
The black line is the reference. That's very low output impedance, 0 0.01 ohm. And that's across the entire frequency band. If you give it a medium impedance of about 0.5, you get this blue line. And you dip down to about half a decibel or so in the mid-range. If you go to a high output impedance of about one ohm, then you drop even more down to about one to one and a half decibels, depending on what frequency you're talking about. And then if you go to a very high output impedance, such as that Prima Luna that I was listening to, you can see two and a half decibels, two and a half decibels. See how well this lines up with the graphic that I showed you earlier when I said, this is what the Prima Luna is actually doing to this speaker. It's a really good approximation. It's not perfect, but it's a really good approximation. Now, if we look at the MoFi Source Point 10 Master Edition, you can see that the output impedance isn't really changing the frequency response much, but it is on the low end to some degree. As you increase the output impedance in the higher frequencies, you'll notice there's little to no change. And if you watch my review of the MoFi Source Point 10 Master Edition, you may recall I pointed out specifically that the speaker crossover has implemented a conjugation network that allows it to flatten out the impedance in the high frequency so it is less susceptible to different amplifiers. That's exactly what we're seeing here. So as you go from amplifier to amplifier with this speaker, don't be surprised if you don't hear much of a difference at all. That was the intent of this speaker's updated crossover design. So these were examples based on themselves. What I wanna do now is to show you something else that I'm doing, which is to take these deltas from these changes and apply them to the actual measured frequency response with a very low output impedance amplifier. That's how I capture my on-axis sensitivity measurements. So as we can see here with the Focal, average sensitivity, 88.2 decibels in black, and you can see the frequency response. Where we saw the output impedance having a bigger impact was in the mid-range and in the higher frequency. If we go to the MoFi, you can see there's very little change here. For me, the importance of this is to be able to look at a speaker and not necessarily say, oh, I need to buy a certain kind of amplifier, but more from the perspective of, yeah, maybe I should stay away from an amplifier with high impedance because you know, this speaker's pretty neutral and I don't want to wreck that. Now you could look at this data and you could say, oh man, this speaker has a really bright top end. I want to bring that down. I'm gonna get a different amplifier. Now there's where your amplifier and speaker synergy come into play. But as I keep saying, the odds of you getting that right out the gate really slim to none. And unless you have, I'm gonna say probably five to 10 different amplifiers and the actual data and blind ABX testing, it's a shot in the dark, guys. I mean, how are you gonna know? So to wrap this all up, do amplifiers sound different? They can. Do all amplifiers sound the same? No, absolutely not. Why? Output impedance. What matters when you're looking at an amplifier spec? Output impedance. But you don't want just one value. You don't want damping factor for just one value. You want the manufacturer to show you the entire curve of output impedance from 20 hertz, 20 kilohertz at minimum. If they can go further than that, that's cool too. Without that curve, you're not really going to know. And all this stuff, while great, it's still an approximation. And I will still provide these in my reviews going forward because I think it's interesting to look at and compare how much a speaker is going to have an impact on different amplifiers and the overall sound you're going to get. But I want you to all be cautious to not read too much into this to the point where you make purchase decisions based off of one single metric, okay? I am adding validity to the argument that amplifiers can change the sound, but that doesn't mean that you should run out and try to pair match amplifiers with speakers. I, in my opinion, get an amplifier with low output impedance, get the speaker you like, and call it a day. If you would like to support what I'm doing here, I would 1 million percent appreciate it. You can do so a couple of different ways. Joining me at patreon.com. That's where I post behind the scenes stuff, do polls, stuff that usually just doesn't make it out to the public, such as my blind listening ABX video that I did and posted there recently. Or you can also use any of my generic affiliate links. They're gonna be in the description section below. If you wanna buy some of them from the usual stores like Walmart or Amazon or Crutchfield, you just click one of those links, go to that page, buy whatever it is that you wanna buy, but I think you have to accept cookies first. And then I will earn a small commission off of that. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's a great way to help me keep doing what I'm doing, especially the Crutchville ones. I'm just gonna be straight up. They give extra commission. 
So if you want to buy an amplifier or something from there, uh, choose them over Amazon and please use my link. I really appreciate it. And I'm just trying to be transparent. I will talk to you all later. Take care.